Tonight is <clears throat> September 1st, 2022, with a special meeting of the Conservation Commission to review um, commissioners' thoughts on amending our bylaws and rules and regulations. Hi, Tom. You're muted. Hi. Hi, Tom. Um, all right, well, I can start. Uh, so, so for, yeah, Chris, to answer your um, question, the warrant notice is for the bylaw revisions and it's due September 16th. Um, so my initial thought was, you know, of course, revising bylaws is very time consuming and we all don't have the time in two weeks to really look at it. Uh, however, I did come up with a brief priority list. Uh, Tom has some comments too. Um, of some things that we can look at um, that we can just keep really simple and submit those edits for wetlands and or stormwater. Um, so for, do you want me to, I can share the list so that you guys can see it. Uh, I added a few things from the one in one drive, but um, we'll start with wetlands first. So from the agenda, some of these items are on here, but I added a few. Wait, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh. Can, you, can you start at the top? Yeah, yeah. So basically, um, I'm just saying if we want to submit any proposed edits for this year's special meeting, the deadline is September 16th. Um, and I have some recommended edits for stormwater and wetlands. Um, and for the rules and regulations, after speaking with legal counsel, they definitely need some work. Um, but that doesn't require a special town meeting. So we can revise our rules and regulations at any time. We just have to do it during a public meeting and vote on them. And we can revise them at any point. Um, but those are a lot longer and um, there's a lot to go over. I also have to convert the scanned PDFs into Word documents, so that's going to be really fun. Um, but, um, you know, I recommend uh, tackling the rules and regulations. We can figure out how we want to do it, but we can either do separate meetings. We can do at the end of meetings that aren't that busy, uh, all the above, whatever you guys prefer. It is going to be a, you know, an in-depth process, but you know, I think it'll be beneficial in the end. Um, so it's it's up to you guys of how you want to do that with the rules and regulations. Um, and then for the bylaws every year, we can keep this list. Um, we can, you know, look at things and change a couple things here and there. For stormwater, since DEP hasn't updated their standards yet, I don't know if we want to change too, too much right now, especially with the regulations, because uh, they're going to change the stormwater standards. I put a, um, a, a slide from when they last spoke of it early in 2022. Um, so those are some of the snapshot changes, but they haven't given us any update yet as to when those changes are coming out. Um, so I don't know how much we really want to touch stormwater, but um, these are some of the wetland edits. I don't know if we can, we, I don't know if anyone has any comments, but one of the main ones that I've highlighted is the isolated vegetated wetland buffer. Right now we have a 25 foot buffer. Um, Amy, uh, our council did say that it was interesting that we only had a 25 foot buffer during our training back in January. Um, I pulled up a lot of the South Shore bylaws from Duxbury, Marshfield, Plymouth, uh, Situate. Most of them have a hundred foot buffer for isolated vegetative wetlands. Um, and uh, Situate actually goes even further for vernal pools. Uh, but yeah, most of them seem to have a hundred foot buffer. So I'm not sure if we want to keep that uh, standard or if we want to create a 50 foot buffer with a 25 foot inner buffer. Um, but long story short with isolated vegetated wetlands, the Wetlands Protection Act doesn't really mention them at all. They really only care about isolated land subject to flooding. So it's up to town bylaws to protect isolated vegetated wetlands. Um, I can pull up the, uh, the wetlands language too so that we can look at it. Um, but yeah, does anyone have any comments about wetlands, uh, isolated vegetated wetlands or any of the buffer zones? This language here, I'm mostly just playing with it because we don't include um, reference to all the resource areas in the Wetland Protection Act. So, I mean, this isn't an urgent edit. I'm kind of just administratively updating stuff like this and we don't have to do any of it. But, um, you know, we do say within 25 feet of any isolated land subject to flooding and any isolated vegetated wetland, and uh, like I said, a lot of South Shore towns tend to do a hundred foot buffer for both of these areas. Uh, well, there's there. So our our bylaws right now only have a 25 foot buffer. They don't have an inner and an outer buffer. 
Nope. For uh, for isolated vegetative wetlands. Right, uh, right. Yeah. yeah. For every other resource, we have the 50 foot buffer for everything except for riverfront. And then the outer buffer is the 50 to 100. But yeah, isolated vegetative wetlands, um, uh, we have 25 feet right now. I, I just say that uh, keep in mind the riverfront is the resource. Yep. Yep. <laughs> it does not have a buffer. It is nope. the resource. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that 200 feet from the river mean high water line out to that 200 feet, that's the whole resource area. Um, it, but it, uh, it, let, me, let me just comment that, that the reason for that is it, it doesn't make very much sense to try to protect a stream uh, without protecting its banks. And uh, the streams are have their own protection. Mm -hmm. uh, nobody's, nobody's talking about damming or uh, diverting a stream here, although there is I, there is language, I believe, somewhere in our bylaws about that, if I'm not mistaken, or at least at the state level. But but uh, the idea that the riverfront is a buffer, which is sort of, I get the get the feeling that some some commissioners don't quite grasp that the resource actually is the river, riverfront, and we should treat it as a resource, not as a buffer zone. So does that resource need a buffer zone? The state does, it, it could have one, but the state doesn't uh, explicitly says in, in, their, in their laws that it, the riverfront does not have a buffer. I, I think, I, I, you know, we've been, we've been talking about a hundred foot inner buffer and a hundred foot outer buffer. Uh, and if we treat anything as a buffer, uh, not, a, not a buffer, let's only rephrase that to say, uh, the riverfront consists of a hundred foot inner riverfront and a hundred foot outer riverfront. And I think that we've been treating both of those zones as a buffer. We've also acknowledged that um, the, uh, I think it's for new construction, the hundred, there has to be a hundred foot undisturbed buffer for new construction. Um, so if anybody was obviously building homes on empty lots, they have to maintain at least a hundred feet uh, within that riverfront area um, of undisturbed land. So we kind of do, like Tom said, treat it like a buffer zone when it's technically a resource area in its entirety. Um, so that might be something to look at with our rules and regulations language. Um, Cause we only really have like a section of it. We could probably put more of that uh, language from the Wetlands Protection Act and potentially be stricter because we pretty much defer to the 10.58 section in the Wetlands Protection Act. And really the only change is that instead of 5,000 square foot alteration, we allow only 1,000. Um, so we pretty much defer to the, the act um, and really only have that small section, section 40 in our regulations. Um, and uh, so those are definitely some considerations that we can think of for the rules and regulations. Um, but yeah. Um, so for yeah, hey, isolated. Hey, oh, sorry. Just just hang there a minute because Tom will be back in a second. I, I sure. wanted Tom's opinion oh, on. Sorry, Tom. Oh, I think I'm sorry. sorry. <laughs> I just interrupted there. Um, no, that's fine. Sorry, you cut out. <laughs> so so Charlotte, could you repeat what you just said? I was I was. I'm sorry. I was deferring my dinner till after the meeting, so. Sorry, yeah, so um, basically in, in our rules and regulations, we really only have that one paragraph, section 40, and we pretty much defer to the, we, we're like the same exact um, uh, procedures as the Wetlands Protection Act, with the only exception that we only allow a 1,000 square foot alteration of the riverfront, whereas the Wetlands Protection Act allows up to 5,000 square feet. Um, if they meet all the standards in 10.58 slash four or, you know, number four, number five, number four is the regular standards and number five would be redevelopment within the riverfront area. So we're stricter than the Wetland Protection Act currently with our regulations. However, you know, we don't have, uh, you know, as we've kind of figured out, we don't really have um, a lot of information about defining the riverfront area, the benefits about it, a lot of bylaws and regulations I've seen from the other South Shore towns that kind of go into a lot of detail about that. So I don't know if we want to copy and paste stuff and make them even longer. Um, we're pretty, you know, succinct saying, def, you know, defer to all uh, Wetland Protection Act standards with the exception of we only allow a thousand square feet alteration. And what I need to look up is I can't remember, but I think we did 
the rules and regulations, I think, are 100 foot undisturbed buffer for new construction. I think that is from us. I don't think that's from the Wetlands Protection Act, but I'd have to double check. Um, so, yeah. If we wanted to create extra standards for the riverfront, we can definitely do that. I think it's worth considering. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of it's it's a very complicated portion in the act and uh, I have to read through it every single time I see a project with the riverfront uh, bunt, um, you know on the on the map uh, on the site plan uh, I have to go through all those standards and that's why I'm always asking for like alternatives analyses and things like that because that's required to meet those standards um, to propose work in there um, so yeah there's a lot um, and sure, then, I, I think having uh, a preamble about the riverfront uh -huh. uh, that echoes, at least echoes the state preamble to what yeah. they say is, is appropriate. I mean, people mm. sh shouldn't, I don't think people should look at look at bylaws and say, what's this for? What What's the point here? Mm -hmm. I think we need to be explicit to spell out what we yeah. need. And I think to the extent that we can put it in the context mm. of, uh, I mean, we're only talking, what are we talking about here? Just a few streams in town talking about the Gulf River, mm -hmm. which kind of surprised me to find out it's, it, it is defined by the state as a, as a river, it's a tidal river, mm -hmm. um, but, it, but it's defined as a, as a river. And, and one of the ways we know that is because the state has created uh, maps mm -hmm. of all the rivers, uh, all, all rivers in the state as defined as having a river mouth. And so if the state is designa designated a river mouth, which it has in the case of the Gulf River, that means the state considers it a river. Okay. It's a little it's a little easier mm -hmm. when it comes to freshwater streams that are that are perennial. Mm -hmm. um, I believe the I, I believe the um, definition is it's presumed to be perennial if the watershed above at, at any point is is 1.5 mi square miles uh -huh. um, or it's a, um, a, a, a stream um, listed in the USGS stream stats uh -huh. uh, database which is which is available on the web and I think most of our applicants at least the engineers uh, use that or are aware of this Mm -hmm. uh, every now and then we run across somebody who, who doesn't understand this and we, mm -hmm. we do tend to point them that way. Um, the, if, if we, I don't remember, I think maybe in the rules and regs, we mentioned that it has to be a stream on a USGS topographic map. That should be changed completely because okay. um, the, the USGS topo maps are one to 24,000 scale and they don't show all the perennial streams on them. At mm -hmm. least is defined by stream stats and the state um, uh, definition of the size of the watershed. Mm -hmm. So, so that's something that that uh, we need to um, maybe look at when we get to our regs. But, but I, I'm in agreement. We, 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 if we can hash out something with the change amendments to our bylaws, now's the time to do it. We've got till the 15th. Mm -hmm. And and here's a chance to kind of tweak some of these. Some of them, some of the some of the language in this is is a little uh, unusual. We refer to telegraph lines um, yeah. <laughs> in in one area. I don't think we have those anymore. We don't even have telephone lines anymore that I know of. Mm -hmm. I think it all goes over uh, telecommunication telecommunication lines, and so that's the that is a word that we use. And I think all the other extraneous ones should be eliminated so that we just. Mm -hmm. You know, simplification is important here. Yeah. So should we, um, I guess for the purposes of updating the bylaws, should we add um, a preamble or a more in-depth definition in our bylaw? Because right now our bylaws only have alter, isolated land subject to flooding, isolated vegetated wetland, person, riverfront, and vernal pool. Um, those are the only definitions we have. Other bylaws have 50,000 of them, like the Wetlands Protection Act. Um, so it kind of depends on what we think is important. But yeah, I think maybe clarifying this isolated land subject to flooding, vegetated wetland, and riverfront would be a good idea. Also, vernal pools, too, if we wanted to add any language. Uh, I was kind of playing around with it. So this is like we don't have to do something like this. But I think, you know, increasing 
the definition uh, clarity in the bylaws is important too. And then uh, the rules and regulations will go into more detail. So if we wanted to just keep these little excerpts for the bylaws, we can do that. Um, so we can choose to put the information either more in the bylaws or more in the regulations. Um, but at least for submitting something by the 16th, I'm I'm not sure. Do we do we have a strong preference for updating this first and then the rules and regs? Um, yeah, I mean, it doesn't make sense to do the rules and regs before you change the bylaws, does it? Yeah, I think the I mean, yeah, the and, bylaws. And, 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 yeah. and, and there's no the due date. There's no due date on that. I mean, we don't have a we don't have a due date on that. We right. we do have a due date every time we want to add something to the warrant, and one's coming up. And it seems right. to me that focusing on mm -hmm. uh, we don't really have that many changes. I mean, I went through them all, and there aren't. Yeah, I think we can. Um, I mean, I'll take out my edits that I'm kind of playing around on, but your edits, Tom, were pretty simple. So like changing just a few words here and there. Um, so like changing some of the. Um, grammatical stuff I think is okay, so we can keep all that. But uh, yeah, I think that some of the main edits that we should probably consider are whether or not we want to increase the buffer zone for isolated vegetated wetlands, uh, define the riverfront more in our bylaw, define maybe vernal pools more in our bylaws. Because um, as it stands now, our bylaws say one thing, but then you go into the regulations and that's not always the exact same language. So, um, uh, so, that's, so that's what we do next. Once we mm -hmm. have once we have a revised right. bylaws, then we rationalize yeah. our regs. Yep. And that. you can update it. Yeah, we can update the rules and regs as often as we want. So um, you know, we can choose to wait until we have all our updates, or we can keep updating it when we update the bylaws. We can just administratively update the rules and regs. Uh, maybe after this gets approved by um, you know the warrant uh, and special town meeting, we can probably update the regs right after that. Um, but uh, does anyone have a strong preference? Um, I can take out these edits, but does anyone have a strong preference for any other edits? I can go over my other ones that I had. So I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on these. Um, so other than the IVW, there are some in dis there are some discrepancies with um, the Wetlands Protection Act versus our bylaws. So although we're allowed to be stricter, we can't be less strict than the Wetlands Protection Act. So one thing that I did notice is our bylaws say, within 21 days of the close of the public hearing, we'll issue permits, denials, or determinations. The word determinations refers to uh, determination of applicability for RDAs. RDAs have to, we have to issue a decision for RDAs within 21 days of receipt, not the close of a public hearing. So with an order of conditions, a denial, or a stormwater permit, we have 21 days after the close of the public hearing, and I have a tracker for that. So just so you guys know, I will never <laughs> be late on that <laughs> to the best of my ability. But for determinations, RDAs are always tricky. And from my trainings with DEP and other uh, organizations, a lot of towns struggle with this because a lot of towns don't meet biweekly. So they have waivers for people to sign if we're not going to meet that 21 day either meeting deadline. Um, people continue RDAs for various reasons. and it doesn't seem like officially DEP cares about that unless somebody appeals it. So it's not that we're it, it, technically, according to the Wetland Protection Act, we're supposed to issue a decision on RDAs in 21 days. So I don't know well, if we so, want to fix so this. We can't now. extend that, Charlotte. Is that correct? We can. I mean, the Wetland Protection Act says we can't, but a lot of towns do it um, because RDAs sometimes have questions, and as long as the applicant agrees in writing or over the public hearing. I mean, the applicant agrees to it, so we're kind of following it. Um, but yeah, if you read the Wetland Protection Act language, it does say within 21 days, the commission shall issue a positive or negative determination. Um, so that is the one thing in our bylaws and rules and regs for RDAs that does need to be consistent with the act. Um, and uh, I don't know if this is something we want to fix now or if we want to just kind of keep that in our in our minds when we get RDA submissions that we probably shouldn't continue them, but I will say that like pretty much every town that I've talked to does. <laughs> um, and no one seems to have a problem with it. Even DEP doesn't seem to have a problem with it unless it's appealed. Um, so if somebody appeals an RDA a decision, whether it's the applicant or a neighbor, for example, um, they can appeal because we didn't follow the, the Wetland Protection Act. Um, so, so wait a minute, it, 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 our hands are tied to here, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's 21 days or less, right? Yep. So how can we change it? What? It doesn't sound um, like we can. So why no. would we even discuss changing it if we can't? 
Yeah, I mean, we do our best with, um, you know, the submission deadlines, but sometimes with um, new submissions, if someone submits something right after a submission deadline, there's a chance that that's not falling within our 21 day window. So I've worked with legal counsel to come up with a waiver for the 21 day review. Hingham has it and it is legal as long as it's quote unquote voluntary. So there is a way that I can, you know, we can get people to acknowledge the 21 day hearing uh, timeline if we're hearing the uh, project within 22 days or more. Um, so there definitely like are things that we can do to try and mitigate this as best we can. So, but so why, don't, why don't we just copy the Hingham? The Hingham yeah, the Hingham. I actually did. <laughs> okay. I actually did. Yeah. So um, actually what I'm doing is uh, if someone submits an RDA or an NOI or a stormwater permit right after a deadline for the next hearing, I will take note of that and have people sign the here uh, the voluntary notice. There's just always a catch where if someone's like, no, I'm not signing this and I want you to review it in 21 days. Most people don't care. Um, so we most people can't, we really... can't we can't change that, Charlotte. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> so so, so uh, we're, we're spinning our wheels here. OK, well, that's yeah, that's just one discrepancy in our bylaws. Um, the next one is permit extensions. Uh, after speaking with legal counsel, our language is slightly different. So I don't know if that's a problem. Um, it doesn't, I, I, it, it's just coming up for some old projects. So um, I don't know if I can make the timeline for this one, but I do want to look at this in more detail. We don't see, I haven't seen since I've been here, we haven't seen an extension permit. So I don't think this is a super high priority item, but the Wetlands Protection Act language is different than our bylaws. We allow an extension of up to, one extension of up to three years where the Wetlands Protection Act seems to be a little bit different and it's really unclear what that timeline is, honestly. So I just kind of want to make sure that that's consistent. But again, I don't think it's a priority. And then um, I'll move on to vernal pools because I know we have this has been a hot topic uh, for our commission recently. So um, based off of our legal training, it sounds like that we protect potential vernal pools as long as it meets the definition of a vernal pool and as we know really the only time to fully do that is to evaluate it in the spring so i don't know if there's something that we wanted to add to our bylaws that all you know all potential and certified vernal pools are presumed to be significant and will have the 100 foot buffer so again we can like isolated vegetated wetlands be stricter than the wetland protection act Wetland Protection Act doesn't really break down potential vernal pools. Um, so I don't know if we want to add something like that. I looked through all of the South Shore bylaws and Situate is one of the only ones that actually has a 250 foot buffer with a 125 foot no disturb. So they were definitely far stricter than everybody else. But for the most part, people had um, like language about potential and uh, certified vernal pools and that they have a 100 foot buffer. So, so just to be clear, Potential vernal pools are are those defined by the state as being right. Managed. I think mm -hmm. we should, I think we should say that explicitly. Yeah, like, I'm sorry, Tom, you got talked over there. They they the state defines them how? Well, the state this the state uh, did a program. Remind me, Charlotte, when when that happened? I, I think it was 2000, early 2000s, something like that. I think I don't so. Know. Anyway, the state had a had a had a one time program to look at all the uh, topography apparently in the state and identify sites that were potential vernal pools but hadn't been verified. Mm -hmm. So we have we have a couple of potentials here in town, and then we have a few certified ones. Certified is the next step. So we extend protection to potential vernal pools under the assumption that uh, uh, I guess that that um, that it is a vernal pool and, and it's up to the applicant then to um, dispute that and, and demonstrate that it's not. Mm -hmm. That's my understanding of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's um, and then we do have that tricky language in our I think it's in our rules and regulations about potential vernal pools that meet the criteria of like certification. And so I think back in January, Amy was like, you guys need to fix that and clarify it. Um, so that's something that we can consider for our rules and regulations specifically, but at least for our bylaws, I didn't know if we wanted to add anything. You know, like I said, I was trying to play around in the definitions here uh, with vernal pools. So I don't know if we're interested in adding 
uh, more clarifying language to this definition. So this is the original one that we have that has to hold water for two consecutive months between December and December and June. I don't know, Tom, if those dates are correct. I've just seen months. I don't know. Yeah. If wanted, I don't think we need to put the dates. I think it's just I think two months is what the state says. And that's yeah. What I saw. OK, did, did, did you yeah. uh, did anyone look at the vernal pool um, definition for Duxbury? I, 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 I kind of like that because they. Uh, Here, they let me a, pull up uh, Duxbury. language regarding the certification, non-certification. They're just like an. Uh, Mm -hmm. If you if you uh, go down to vernal pool definition here, yep. I, I can't remember it all. Uh, also, I like up. how I like how some of uh, actually just now that you mention it, Chris, for Duxbury legal counsel suggested looking at Duxbury's regulations because they're pretty they're pretty well um, structured. So this is kind of what I was looking at at least for listing all the stuff. But let me go down to vernal pools here. Um, it won't it won't come up like that you have to yeah you have to go down to this oh section. you have to scroll down okay yeah. i think that i think that this one there, oh. there it was oh there, yeah, it is. there you go there it is got it okay so confined base and depression sorry i won't read aloud <laughs> Don't move. <laughs> Sorry, I was moving. I wanted to put the whole thing on the screen. Oh, okay. The, the last part, the presumption of the central mm -hmm. vernal pool habitat value. Mm -hmm. was, this is a pretty good definition. So essentially that, that oh. I think we we say the same thing, maybe not quite so succinctly. But so, but, 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 but the intent is the same that that um, that if it if it uh, appears like it could meet the criteria, uh -huh. then it's sort of up to the applicant uh -huh. to demonstrate that it's not a vernal pool. Uh -huh. Well, how do they do that, Tom? Well, they got to wait till. Well, there there are a number of ways. There there is more than just the obligate species. You can, I think, you can advance uh, a vernal pool or actually uh, dispute it by looking at the soil characteristics and and things like uh, a mat of flattened leaves that have been in the water. I, I, I remember running across this somewhere in the state regs, um, where there are criteria for um, off season determination of potential vernal pools. There's guidance too. Yeah, I think, yeah. is it the dry vernal pool guidance, Tom? Cause that's like yeah, really yeah. good. And then there's also aerial guidance that yeah. if you can do aerial surveys and look at them in certain times of the year. Um, yeah, there's definitely a lot of helpful documents out there for vernal pool identifications during various times of the year. So if the applicant is uh, submitting something other than outside the, you know, the springtime period, um, they would have to go by proving a lot of that to us mm -hmm. using all that <laughs> information. I mean, we, we see in our own topography here, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of closed topographic depressions. Mm -hmm. And since we're sitting on bedrock in a lot of places and percolation into the subsurface is pretty limited, especially in something that always fills up every spring, all those all the all the drains in the bottom of these pools that might go into fractures or whatever, pretty much plugged up with muck, mm -hmm. and so they'll hold water for a long time. Uh, we I see it around my own property, in fact, mm -hmm. uh, and and surrounding properties that that uh, even though they aren't vernal pools, there are these depressions that hold water for an awful long time, mm -hmm. um, and and so um, I, I think I think that that uh, anytime you, you see one of these closed depressions, you have to start thinking, well, is it a vernal pool? I mean, it's certainly uh, likely. I think one of the things that Charlotte and I may have kind of um, encountered was that places that look like they're really good vernal pools don't obviously don't have any of the obligate species. And my own opinion is that most of these tend to be in neighborhoods where the, over, the, the surrounding forest is gone. So it's not just a matter of them not being able to breed there. They've been run off by, uh, or, or the environment has changed by landscaping so that they're no longer 
uh, hospitable to wood frogs and salamanders and stuff. Too many streets, so they get run over or not enough uh, leaf cover for them to be able to hide. Um, application of pesticides and herbicides, non-native plants that they don't can't deal with it means there's not there's there's the insects that they probably live on or aren't there because they're not eating those ornamentals or whatever. So um, it's it's a tricky thing, right? You can have all the ingredients for a vernal pool, but if you're missing the surrounding habitat for toads and salamanders and frogs and newts and stuff to live in, they're not going to be there. Yeah. Do we um, want to copy this essentially and then maybe just modify it? Like, do we want to add this to our uh, bylaw definition and then kind of modify it how we see fit? I'm pretty sure they're getting this information. This language looks like it's directly from the NHESP uh, vernal pool guidance. Um, so this looks, this almost, this language looks very familiar to me. <laughs> um, and then I don't know if they added the, the buffer zone stuff or the presumption stuff, but yeah, this language does, does looks familiar to me. So I feel like they got this from somewhere. Um, same thing with isolated land subject to flooding. They're giving it a hundred foot buffer zone, which, um, uh, we don't have either with IVWs. So they, uh, um, I think they kind of relate, don't they? I mean, if uh, mm -hmm. if if it's yeah. can't yep. define it as a, a vernal pool, then right, you know, uh, yeah, and isolated land subject to flooding or IVWs sometimes can be similar, but the Wetland Protection Act acknowledges isolated land subject to flooding, not necessarily isolated vegetated wetlands. I think isolated vegetated wetlands are mentioned like once or twice in the regulations. Uh, they care more about this as a resource area rather than an isolated vegetated wetland, which is kind of weird because sometimes they can be similar <laughs> or in the same area. Um, but yeah, with vernal pools, this seems like a pretty solid definition if we wanted to add it to our bylaws um, or to our language. Um, you know, yeah, have I'd be in favor, I'd of, be that. In favor of that. Yeah, just, okay. Just, uh, just lifting it wholesale and, and, <laughs> and uh, because, because it, it is more, um, I guess, um, sophisticated than what we have already. Yeah. Okay, I'll make that as a note. No, no, no sense in reinventing the wheel here. If somebody's written yeah. something that 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 does what we are uh, mm -hmm. trying to do, mm -hmm. and it's, and it's well written. Um, yeah, let's, they did. There's recently. Let's plaguerize them. Okay, <laughs> they, right. that's probably what they did. Yeah, just, yeah. yeah, I'm sure. You know, <laughs> um, did we want to do something similar for isolated vegetated wetlands, or do we have any strong preference of keeping it as 25 feet for now? No, I, think, I think it's kind of the, those kind of uh, go together. In my, yeah. In my yeah. opinion, just because uh, mm -hmm. you know it kind of uh, alleviates us from from the whole definition of vernal pool if we have a hundred foot buffer for isolated wetlands, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, a lot of the, these bylaws have the language about vegetated wetlands, whether they're bordering or isolated, are all presumed to be significant, and they have the 100-foot buffer environment, and they a lot of bylaws uh, here have language about that, so they go into detail about, uh, yeah. is that Eric? There he is. <laughs> so, so the difference between uh, land subject to um, flooding and and a vernal pool. Uh, in one case, the vernal pool has a hundred foot no disturb zone around it. Mm -hmm. So, so, so I think maybe just by turning the isolated uh, vegetated wetlands into, you know, essentially defining them the same way we do bordering. Yeah, vegetated wetlands make sense. A fifty foot mm -hmm. buffer and a hundred foot yeah outer outer buffer, which. Um, isn't quite as draconian as as all of a sudden taking all these little isolated spots and and making them um, difficult to to deal with in somebody's yard or new mm -hmm. construction or whatever. Mm -hmm. So so I I would think that we'd want to do just basically extend the protections that we already used for the EVWs to the IVWs and and. Okay. Uh, do we know why? why and, but that? then still retain the vernal pool 
uh, right. issue where it's there's there's a hundred foot no disturb zone around. Yeah, we can put that we can put that in our bylaws actually and or rules and regulations. Um, our our bylaws don't mention the 50 foot no disturb. It's really our regulations that go into the details of like the 50 foot buffer around the uh, resource area is no disturbed yeah. unless a grant a variance is granted by the commission. So I don't know if that me I don't know if we want to add that to the bylaws as well. But usually the rules and regulations are where you go into detail. So it's it's kind of like I don't know if there's a rhyme or reason as to how much you should add to the bylaw. But some of these bylaws, as you can see, like this is 66 pages, but this is also their, these are their regulations. Some of them just have regulations or bylaws or one or the other, whereas um, we have both. So I think it's up to us as to where, where we want to add that information. Um, I think either way, either place is good, um, unless we want to put it in both to be consistent. But the bylaws are typically a lot shorter, more, um, you know, they define the limits and then the rules and regulations go into details about the procedures. So we could put the no disturbs information in the bylaws and the regulations and then have the regulations speak more. To what that. do you mean when they're together, they're just together in the same document? Yeah, yeah, the, well. The, 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 rules, the rules don't need to be on the warrant. Right. And rules and regs. So obviously yeah. uh, just because they're combined in the same document, that's a convenience to the mm -hmm. union. So we need to keep that in mind. So it doesn't sure. really matter whether we have a two separate documents or we combine them in one. Right. Um, they're they're legally different entities. They are. And, yep, they are. So yeah. I mean, again, that I don't think we need to worry about that now. Okay. Um, okay. So I have uh, at least summarizing so far. And Eric, thanks for joining us. Uh, sounds like we want to be consistent with other South Shore towns and increase the 25 foot IVW buffer to 100 feet with the same parameters as a 50 foot no disturb to our bordering vegetated wetlands and other resources. And then for a vernal pool or isolated land subject to flooding, same thing, the 100 foot buffer like these other towns are having. And then with vernal pools, 100 foot buffer, the presumed to be significant for potential and certified with a 100 foot no disturb, unless, you know, again, if someone proves otherwise that doesn't meet the definition of a vernal pool. So, so far that's a, those are some pretty solid edits. <laughs> um, do you guys want me to go through the rest of my list here? Or do we want to move on to stormwater? I know Eric or uh, Chris, we didn't want to keep this meeting to be for you know for too long. Well, Charlotte, I mean, you already said that the state's going to change the stormwater rules, and I yeah. think I think it's premature to um, yeah. try to change our our bylaws mm -hmm. before the state is is. It, it, as I understand it, it is imminent that they they are changing substantially Absolutely. changing those. So yeah, I, personally, I think I think we had to focus on wetlands. Okay. And and uh, stormwater, you know, we could very well have new bylaws and find out either we contradict the new rules or we don't incorporate them or whatever. So it'd be an exercise that we don't need to take, I think. Okay. Yes, yeah, there are just like a couple things. Uh, one of the main ones that is stormwater permits that we issue do not have expiration dates. <laughs> yeah. uh, yeah. I've never heard of a permit that way. Uh, so we're kind of caught. These are some of um, some uh, suggestions that uh, I think Chris, you, you suggested. Uh, Chris, sorry, Chris McFarland. <laughs> um, so as it is right now, just so you guys are kind of aware, there's really no incentive for um, an applicant to close out an order of conditions or a stormwater permit unless it's tied to an occupancy permit from the building inspector or a housing sale. So orders of conditions are recorded with the registry, it's required. And so that normally comes through in a housing sale. And so that's why you guys will see that I will be occasionally showing you these ancient projects that nobody ever closed out because someone is finally moving and the uh, title search brings up that permit. And so for stormwater, even though we don't require those to be recorded, um, stormwater permits are obviously on record. And so whenever there's an open stormwater permit, and someone's filing for an occupancy permit, um, the building inspector does not sign off on a certificate of occupancy until all permits have been closed out. So he waits for me to close out stormwater permits. So that's another reason why people have an incentive to get them closed out. And then the other reason why there's no incentive is because stormwater permits also don't have expiration dates right now. We don't have anything that sets um, you know, a three-year, five-year, 10-year requirement. Um, so there's no reason for anybody to ever close them out unless they're moving. Um, so I don't know if we want to incorporate an expiration date into the bylaws or if we want to save that for rules and regs. 
Um, and then the other question I mostly had, which I don't think would impact DEP, um, but we have these set numbers of the main qualifications for stormwater permits. Um, so a lot of people play what's called what I call the numbers game, where they can technically do very large projects without needing a stormwater permit. So in theory, someone could alter 4,999 square feet without a permit from us if they're not increasing impervious past 500 square feet. So there's a, I haven't done enough research on other towns of what they have. A lot of towns actually break it down by zone, by types of activities, it gets quite complicated. Ours is very straightforward of, are you increasing impervious by 500 square feet or more like a net increase, or are you altering 5,000 square feet? So I don't know if we want to change those numbers. And, you know, as you said, Tom, we don't have to do it now. This is, these are just some of the questions that I kind of wanted to bring to you guys. Um, so if we want to hold off on the stormwater bylaw, we can definitely do that. Um, but then the other important question, which I think we might need more time with is this land alteration bylaw, which is kind of throwing everyone for a loop right now. Um, the language is quite confusing and it sounds like that, it sounds like at least the interpretation is you can get a special permit from planning from a stormwater permit from us or a building permit from the building inspector for earth removing activities, but then it's a zoning bylaw. So in theory, it should be enforced by zoning, but then they reference our wetlands and stormwater bylaws saying, oh, you can get a stormwater permit to meet these expectations. So it's very confusing and I haven't um, been able to- I, I, think, I think that's probably, I mean, it looks, it sounds to me like the uh, stormwater uh, bylaws and rules and regs are gonna be far more complex than yeah. Um, what we need to do to oh, the, yeah. to the um, wetlands mm -hmm. that we're talking uh, yeah. Yeah. that we're there, talking about, yep. and there's another thing to consider too. When we bring something before town meeting, um, if it's really complicated mm -hmm. and it's really long, yep, it's probably uh, in jeopardy. Yeah. So let's let's give the public one one bite at a time instead of a feast. Sure. No, that's a good point. Um, and also the, I won't get into this, but I put a bunch of this stuff in OneDrive so you guys can look at it. No rush to do it before the 16th, but there's a lot of stormwater resources out there. I took a bylaw um, like a uh, course, I actually went to the, um, to this place in a, uh, oh crap, I can't remember where it was. It was in Worcester and I actually went with the planning director and there's this bylaw land use uh, planning tool to update your bylaws with the best possible best management practices. And just th the amount of time that it's gonna take to look at stuff like that is obviously gonna be very time consuming, but it is a very useful tool. And so uh, the planning director and I were like looking at that to see how we can corp incorporate edits. Cause you know, when, some, when one department makes edits to their bylaws, you know, it's, it's kind of confusing as to how that affects everybody else. And so, that there's just a lot of resources out there specifically for stormwater. But yeah, until DEP gives us that main guidance, I don't know if we should really rock the boat because stormwater is going to get very tricky, very technical. I don't know if we want to look at having somebody look at it for us, like a professional who's obviously like a licensed engineer or someone like that. Like we have options. There's definitely grants you can apply for too. But yeah, it's just uh, stormwater gets very complicated very quickly. <laughs> so not sure how much we want to do now, but really the main issues that I had were stormwater permit expiration dates and uh, any, um, if we wanted to add any expiration date to the bylaw. Um, so, and if we're comfortable with this in between like people submitting large projects and not needing a stormwater permit for now, at least for less than 5,000 square feet, um, then I can just leave it alone. Uh, Cause most people know the rules by now. Um, so it's up to you guys if we wanted to fix this now or just wait on, on all edits until DEP comes up. I, I think we should wait and take the time to look at this very carefully to try yeah. to figure out what the best way to go is. Okay, that sounds good to me. I mean, it, 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 this, this is such a complex little thing. I mm -hmm. mean, you know, you could, you could, you know, you could put in 400 square feet of brick today Right. And then 400 square foot of brick next week. Yep. You could just keep going. And then all of a sudden you can go in and say, look, I'm taking all this brick out. So, yeah. I mean, it, it, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a tough one. Let's wait. Yeah. From an enforcement side, I will admit it is very tricky because again, people play these games where they're ripping out driveways and then 
they're not changing the net increase by 500 square feet or more. So again, yeah, they can do this massive project and technically not need a stormwater permit from us. Yeah. Um, so it's, if we wanna wait on that, it's just something to consider. <laughs> um, but I guess we can focus on just wetlands for now. Is that what we're in agreement with of just making some edits to the wetlands bylaws and leaving stormwater alone? Yes. Okay. That's, That's my preference. Do I, do I need to take a vote? Uh, I think we should, but I guess, Chris, no, do we no. want to follow up with Amy uh, and send our suggested language to her and see what she thinks, and then we can come back and v officially vote on it, or uh, yes. how do you want to do this? Yes, yes, let's do that. Okay. Um, so legal counsel said that they could do a meeting um, on the 14th or the 15th, so that following Thursday after our meeting on the 8th, if we wanted to do that, hopefully it shouldn't take too long. I can put together the language that we want to look at and have Amy look at it in advance, and then we all just talk about it and vote on it. Um, or we could do that um, at the September 8th meeting if we wanted to. I don't know if I'll be able to. I thought the deadline for getting it on the warrant was the 15th. The September. It's the 16th. So 16th. it's that Friday, I think. So if they, if they can Friday? review this on, on the 14th or the 15th, I don't see where there's any room for us to come back and vote on it after it's been reviewed by legal counsel. Yeah. Oh, I meant like uh, have have Amy look at it. Like I'll send it to her hopefully tomorrow or Tuesday, have her look at it, and then we can either meet together with legal counsel on the 14th to go over it and then vote on it. Does that no, sound let's, like no, let's, yeah. if you're going to send it to Amy and she's going to go through it, then we should just look at it on the 8th and call it, and call it a day. Okay. Can we add that? Yeah. Can we add that to the agenda still? Uh, yes, it just has to be within 48 hours. So I'll just uh, tell Angela tomorrow because um, okay. uh, we can technically revise the agenda up until Tuesday afternoon. After that, we can take stuff off the agenda, but we can't add things. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Tell, her to, tell her to add it. So. Okay. All right. Charlotte, yes. did you um, notice um, how many other towns have expiration dates um, for the uh, stormwater permits? No, I wish I had time to look at that. I was focusing on wetlands. Okay, <laughs> I took um, an initial guess uh, that we cared a little bit more about our wetlands bylaws. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I was like, okay. I got to put my time into this. But yeah, yeah I definitely want to look at that because it, I find it weird that our permits don't have expiration dates. It's right. Weird. Um, building permits, all of our other wetlands permits, they all have expiration dates. So, but no immediate rush if that's how we've been doing things for the last, you know, 15, 20 years. So. so Charlotte, the documents that you have posted now are um, um, consistent with what we've agreed to tonight, or do you need to make any changes to them? So I need to just add- For the wetlands, let's not, we're not talking, I'm not talking about stormwater. Just, yeah, so I need to the add- wetlands bylaws. I was gonna take out like, Tom, all of our edits and just have those three edits. So I was just gonna make a new Word document with the wetlands bylaws. And by the way, the formatting is atrocious. So I have to fight with that. That's why I'm, I'm not using that document that I was giving you guys. Um, Cause it's a, it's a PDF. And when you convert it to a PDF, it changes all the page breaks. It's so you frustrating. Convert it to work, you convert it to Word. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. it's it changes all the page breaks, though. It's very frustrating. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm just going to copy it all from scratch, and then I don't have those awkward formatting problems. But anyway, so I will give everyone a new, the, the, the Word version of the bylaw with those three edits, with the vernal pool, 100 foot no disturb, isolated land subject to flooding language, and the 100 foot buffer to the isolated vegetated wetland with the 50 foot no disturb. Um, so I'll, I'll put all that language in the um, a fresh word version of the wetlands bylaws and then I'll give that to legal counsel and hopefully we can get a response um, and then maybe on the 8th at the end we can look at it see what her input was and vote on it. You know, hopefully we can get a chance to look at it before the 8th so that I'll try I'll try my best it's not it's not well, easy with the holiday. Charlotte, even if you get it posted on the 7th uh, back on the shared drive I mean that's mm -hmm probably enough time. I can edit it probably after this call, honestly. I might just I might just do that to give myself time because I have visits tomorrow. Okay. Um, so I might uh, put the fresh version of the wetlands word bylaw with those edits on there and then everyone can look at them and I'll send it to legal counsel same day, hopefully tomorrow. So I'll tell her to please look at this <laughs> ASAP. Right. Um, and then in the meantime, I'll, I'll ask Angela to put the bylaw language on the agenda. Okay, thank you. Yeah, keep it simple. 
but I agree with you there. The more we add, the more confusing it might be at town meeting. So it might be good to just keep a couple things on the list for now. And do the rest in rules and regulations. What's up? Sorry. Do the rest in rules and regulations. Uh, do we want to do we want to update that with the edits or just leave that alone and then wait for them to approve it? Let's wait and see what we've got approved. There's no point in writing rules and regs on something that's yeah. not approved. True. Exactly. True. Yeah, it's going to take, uh, I mean, they're going to look at it in December. So we're submitting it months in advance for them to process it all. Um, and I've never gone through this, so please bear with me. I'll learn a bunch about this process as I can. So maybe we can kind of do a couple things each year if we wanted to do that. That seems to be how people do it. They do a couple things each year. Um, but I don't know. <laughs> Not sure with Cohasset. I'm new to the process. Um, all right. Was there any? Was there anything else? No. Kathy, you seem to have had some ideas that we haven't heard. Who did you say? Kathy. Okay. Did you, did you did you say you had some ideas that we haven't heard? Um I don't think so. Oh, okay. My mistake. Uh, are are you referring to um like the land alteration bylaw? No, no, you, I, I thought, I thought when, when this, when we all got on in the beginning, you were trying to call up some, some documents. So I thought you had kind of a, I thought you had something you were referring to that, that no, you might was, want to share. No, I'm sorry. I was just pulling up the documents that oh, I, okay. um, Charlotte distributed. Yes. Sorry. All right. Um, I can keep all of these documents in OneDrive. Just maybe I'll just list list it as like bylaw folder or something, and I'll just um. You guys should have editing access to the the working documents, but if you don't, just let me know. Um, uh, sometimes IT says you have it, and then you guys tell me that you don't, and I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> it's like, like I don't know, guys. Figure it out for me. I'm giving them access, but it's not working, so. Um, I'll keep that folder. I'll probably just like move it to like a general area and I can share the link with you guys. And then you guys can go in there and look at all the resources that I've kind of collected in there. Um, I have a running list for rules and regulations. So feel free to add to that. Um, so I'm kind of just keeping it all in one place on my computer, but I just put a lot of them in one there for you guys. Thank you. Cool. <laughs> Yeah, it's very time consuming. I try. I do it in pieces. <laughs> I, I would say this has been a good exercise to review our bylaws um, word by word, which mm -hmm. I did. And, I, and um, it's a reminder of what we can do and what we can't do. Yeah. I should probably do the same thing to the state, reread the state bylaws again um, to get more familiar. But, um, but this was, a, I think, a useful effort. And, and you did a great job, Charlotte, of, of, <laughs> of um, fighting the inconsistencies and, and uh, weak points. And the rules and regs have a lot more. Well, yeah, yeah that's, gonna, yeah, yeah. that's a whole new can of worms. <laughs> so, yeah, the, the rules and regs are tricky. I also have to find the time to turn it into a Word document because it's a, a scanned version of a PDF. So it's not a PDF that I could just convert. I have to. Copy and paste. Oh, I, I've, I've got one. You do? Well, I, I took the scanned hmm. image and I uh, did uh, optical character recognition on it so that you oh, could okay. copy, copy and paste. I thought I gave that to you at one time. I'll, you I'll gave me the edit, of, like the one where you could search the scanned document. Is that it? Is yeah, that the same one? Yeah, yeah. You, can, it, it, you can't search it unless you can also yeah. copy and paste out of it. Okay, so can I turn it into a Word document? Because every time I try to do that, it like always freaks out with formatting and has it all these does. words. And you know wrong. what the easiest thing to do, Charlotte, is to do it paragraph, you know, copy a paragraph, yeah. put it oh, into chunks. put it into a text file, mm -hmm. and then go from text to word. Okay. Because otherwise it's gonna okay. carry across some invisible um Yeah, stuff. it's a nightmare. So, yeah, you know, if you use notepad or I don't know, you probably use a Mac or something. Okay. Uh, one of those other weird computers. Yeah, no, I have a PC, so I'll do okay. that. So you can just use um, you can just use Notepad to do okay. that because it won't have any. It might have um, uh, carriage returns, but I think that's just about it. But if okay. you do it paragraph by paragraph, and you and then you build your new lists, hmm. um, numbered okay. lists or bullet pointed lists, 
That'd be great. Because <laughs> that's where it really, this thing just completely freaks out if you try to go from PDF to Word and it's got um, lists in it. It mm -hmm. just doesn't work. And even paragraphs, it just okay. It just doesn't work very well. So good to know the text file thing. I will do that first yeah. and uh, and go from there. It's going to take me a while though. I gotta. I usually do them on like Tuesday evenings when it's really quiet. People leaving me alone with phone calls. So <laughs> uh, a, a couple of months ago, I did a big one that was written in French, oh. and, and uh, there is a program uh, that's a really good translator. So I had to run each paragraph through this through this uh, translator and then into Word. So mm -hmm. I learned all the flaws of going from PDF to, oh, uh, to Word when I was doing that. And mm -hmm. it's not much fun. No, no. <laughs> oh, Eric, you're muted. <laughs> you're lucky. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for reminding me. I, now I, can, I can get back on board, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll send you guys the um, the fresh, uh, you know, Word doc with our edits, and uh, let me know what you think, and I'll send that to legal counsel, and hopefully, we can turn it around quickly. Okay. Great. Sounds okay. good. Yeah, and I got a couple items off the September eighth agenda, so that does free up some time for the bylaw stuff. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm. I'm. One other thing I'm thinking with the rules and regulations, and I, I don't know if we can do it, hmm. but it would it would be nice if we could figure a way to like limit how many hearings we have in a week. And I, I know that always comes into to play, but it but it only comes it should only come into play with the with the first like the first hearing, right? As long as we so so maybe that has to do more with when you continue it to, you know, like you continue it right. to to the next hearing if there are less than X number of hearings and then it has to jump ahead if that's the case. Yeah, that's, actually, I mean, we can, I think we can look into that uh, because, you know, when we continue, uh, you know, a handful of hearings and then I already have five, six, seven items on the agenda and show causes obviously come up. I can't plan for those COCs show up out of nowhere. So yeah, if we want to create some sort of limit that's something we can look into. Um, yeah, don't you like you know, the midnight, midnight, long agendas? Uh, midnight, uh, uh, vote to adjourn. You know, I'm not. I'm. I'm not against the midnight, but but I do think we all change our attitude when we have when twelve things on the agenda. Yeah, we've also tried to stick to times, but every project's different. So like some boards do a very strict regiment of times. Other boards do two minutes per commissioner, and they keep going. So it's more of like a procedural thing for them. I don't know if it's in their rules regulations, but. I don't know if they have as many projects as we do. So that's a big caveat. Mm -hmm. Like I know planning and zoning can have a handful, but for all the other boards, I don't think they have as large of an agenda as we do. Mm -hmm. We also meet bi-weekly. So it's like, it's a lot of work to plan for these meetings for all of us involved. And uh, we get <laughs> a lot of items. I've also noticed um, there is a trend, just so you guys are aware, there's been a massive increase in submissions pretty much across the board. I've talked to Hingham and Hall and a few other agents and it's the same across the board. So I don't know if that means people are just more informed and actually submitting permission for things that they may have may have used to been done without, you know, people doing it. But uh, there's just been a huge increase in submissions um, slowly throughout the years, and it's just getting, you know, getting larger. Um, so uh, Hingham has a process that they have with administrative approvals and whether or not the Wetlands Protection Act agrees with that, I don't know, but that helps them cut down on submissions. Like for tree removal requests, for example, they have an administrative process, but I don't know if that's okay <laughs> um, with the Wetlands Protection Act. So um, yeah, yeah, it's busy. <laughs> so so do you think we can put a um, parameter around how many hearings we do, or is it just um, another, it, it, Depends every week. You just have to. Yeah, I mean, we we might be able to. Uh, I would have to look at the wetland protection language to make sure we we aren't like less strict than they are. But if there isn't anything specific in the act, maybe we could. Um, it might also apply to open meeting law too. And I admit I'm not as familiar with that as I should be, even though I know the obviously the, the hardcore basics, of course, to run a meeting. But uh, yeah, me, I don't know if there's any limitations in the general laws. Um, and if there's not, maybe we, we could put in um, 
you know, something like that. Like if there's more than a certain amount of items, it'll get continued to the following month. Or even a time limit. I yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like no more than a certain amount of hearings. I don't know if we can do that, but something Nine hours or. Oh yeah. That's too. <laughs> no more than a couple hours per project or whatever it is. I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, be That'd be difficult to track though. I'd have to like time each one. Um, <laughs> or just for, yeah. Yeah. And you'd want to finish also if you, if you mm. a three hour meeting and then you'd, mm -hmm. you would want to cut something off. I think uh, I would have to look into it, but I'm pretty sure other boards have a time limit. At least I don't know if they do it in their regulations or if they just procedurally say we're ending at nine o'clock or something. Yeah. It, it's a good question. Um, I can look into that because I know other boards definitely run it differently than we do. Uh, whether or not that's a good thing or a bad thing. Mm -hmm. it's up, to, up to all of us to maybe look at that but uh um yeah i can see what other procedures are and maybe we can cut down on late night meetings for all of us <laughs> i'm sure we'd all like that i, th I think our applicants need to get a fair her hearing yes and it and i think i feel it's our responsibility to make sure that the bylaws are complied with and our rules mm -hmm. and regulations are complied with so mm -hmm. that we don't we don't start glossing over things that we shouldn't yeah, I agree. Uh, and and I think Chris's idea of, of having a set number of cases that we um, that we have each each meeting is probably a better way of regulating it than setting a time mm -hmm. limit on any given application. Yeah, I, I feel another, more comfortable um, with that. Yeah, another idea is it's very clear in our regulations that we have a seven day deadline for revised documents, so we could add language saying. If revised documents are not submitted prior to the seven days, it will result in an automatic continuance to the following meeting. So we can put that in our regulations and or bylaws because um, uh, some people have actually, for this meeting next week, there was one project that's like, we need to continue. We didn't get you documents in time. So they've already kind of, some of them have at least taken that into account and also other boards in town I don't know what their process is, but other boards are like, you didn't get us documents in time, we're continuing the hearing. So we maybe we could add some language like that too that would also help cut down on agendas um, and opening hearings for the sake of opening hearings sounds inefficient. Um, Cause uh, I do my best to review documents as quickly as I can to give everybody else enough time to edit the documents, but there's only so much I can do. You know, obviously things come up and I'm in visits and I'm not obviously sitting in the office 100% of the time. So I do my best to turn it around. So sometimes it is, related to me, I will admit, if I can't review things in 72 hours, um, I try my best, but it's not always possible for every submission. Um, but we could create additional um, language clarifying that, that this deadline will result in a continuance if you don't meet it, so. That, that sounds like a good throttle to me. Yeah, yeah sure. then it gets all the engineers to give me th things on time, so. <laughs> well, not just engineers, well, but. You know, isn't, you know. your, isn't there already a seven day? Yep. Somewhere. Yep. We have it in our stormwater and wetlands regulations. And I think, I can't remember if the language is in the bylaws too, but we do have that. We just don't say we're going to automatically continue a hearing or anything if you don't get it to us. I can tell people that. I'm like, you need to give us documents by four o'clock on Thursday. If you don't, the commission may want to continue it. So, you know, it can yeah. be. Yeah. I mean, if it'll, be, if, yeah. it, if it'll make it easier for you to, to push mm -hmm. them off. Yeah, I can also deadline. say like, seems like, a, like seems like an easy fix. Like, yeah, uh, I can also notify you guys too when I don't get seven day documents, you know, the deadlines. And so you guys are aware of those projects. So if they want to open the hearing and the applicant's insistent, we can say, okay, great, we'll open the hearing, but we're going to continue because our commissioners didn't have enough time to look at it. So it's up to us on how we want to phrase the language or if we just want to do this procedurally, but it's definitely a good thing to consider to cut down on long meetings. And having- I've been, I've been, I've been at uh, presentations to planning boards where if a document is not submitted within seven days, it's not allowed to be shown at the hearing. Okay, okay. So if you, you know, if, if you don't get that last document in, you can mm -hmm. come in front of us again if you want to, but don't pull that, that board out because right. you're not allowed to talk about it. Are you talking about our planning board, Chris? No, I'm not. No. <laughs> well, I know one time our planning board, I think they got documents a day before the meeting, and I think like a lot of people did it, and they just continued all of the items automatically, pretty much. Like they opened the hearing and said, all of you gave us documents far too late. We're continuing the hearings. Um, I don't remember what meeting that was, Tom, but <laughs> it was one of them. <laughs> um, but uh, 
yeah, so um, definitely would help make our lives a little bit easier. Um, yeah. But we, uh, Charlotte, we have received in the last few weeks documents the day before mm -hmm. on, on 46 Border Street. Yeah, which that's what we continued which last I time. Personally, I personally have not had a chance to read and I, I didn't mention it, but I think when that comes up again, I will probably either recuse myself mm -hmm. or publicly ask that we postpone uh, yeah. that discussion for until the next meeting, because it's it's really unfair to yeah. the commissioners. It is. We're doing all sorts of different things in their lives, right? Mm -hmm. So well, we'll, uh, let's, let's, was... let's plan on firming that up in the rules and regulations. So. Okay, makes sense. All right, all right. any Keep other talking. comments? Uh, Chris, I'm, I'm sorry I missed the first part of the meeting. Uh, we'll be going back and doing the rules and regulations in a, a similar way in the future, I guess. Yes. Is that the plan? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah, we don't have a time uh, frame for that, Eric. We can revise them whenever we want, um, and we don't need a warrant to do it. So it's definitely a big project for us to tackle, but I'm, I'm ambitious because I think it'll really make this board, you know, uh, have better tools than we, that we have right now. Um, I can so understand. I can understand why the bylaws uh, are at the top of the heap, mm -hmm. but on a day-by-day -day basis, much more important is to have a useful rules and regulations. Mm -hmm. Something holds together, and the you know twenty-four and Article thirty-two makes sense together because there are a lot of contradictions that we have right now, which mm -hmm. make our job in terms of implementing the wetland regs and mm -hmm. in terms of the applicant uh, uncertain when we sit down as to what we should do. Mm -hmm. All these questions as to, you know, bordering vegetated wetlands and replication, which kind of are not covered at all. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it may make everything sort of uh, fall under a, uh, a cloak of uncertainty. Yep. I think what I would love, love to do, and obviously this is like up to you guys as well. Once I make those word documents for the stormwater and the wetlands rules and regulations, they can live in OneDrive and I'll give you guys permission to edit them. And then all of you can put in edits, comments, things we want to look at. It will get messy, but at least we all have a place to work on the same document. And uh, that could be something that at least you guys can see what Tom or what Chris or what Eric or Kathy are all putting in and then be like, oh, okay, that makes sense. And then you can add to the comments. So like a living, a living document uh, would be helpful. Um, and then we can like look at those edits. We can go by section, you know, however we want to do it. It's definitely not going to take one evening. It's going to probably take more than that. <laughs> uh -huh. so what Eric said reminded me of something, Charlotte. Hmm. Um, and you and I have had a conversation about uh, how we might look at uh, wetland restoration mm -hmm. uh, through a different, with a different perspective. Yeah. And if we were to change, uh, um, let's say, uh, our, our rules about invasive species, whether they could be removed or not, does that need to be in the bylaw or does it is that something we can do through the regs? I think mostly through regs, but I can always double check with legal counsel. Cause like I said, I really don't know if there's a rhyme or reason. The bylaws basically say these are our, like we're defining our jurisdiction essentially. Yeah. And then it says we're allowed to make rules and regulations on the procedures and everything else. So I think a lot of this information can live in the rules and regulations. Okay. Um, Cause that's where all of our language is about variances and no disturb and a thousand square foot alterations. So I think all of that can live in the regulations unless council thinks otherwise. But yeah, for invasive stuff, we need like a whole section on that. <laughs> yeah, so so I mean, really what comes to mind as, as an example of this where I felt that that uh, it th there was at least a credible case for uh, restoration was that um, on Atlantic Avenue there at the outlet to Little Harbor mm. uh, where it's just a jungle down there. I, I, I'm down there pretty frequently, you know, because I fish that reach of the Tidal River quite a lot. And uh, so I'm pretty familiar with what a jungle it is. And, and I thought that some of their plan looked fairly reasonable to do. Mm. And it, it, I'm just wondering, you know, I mean, we're really rigid about, I think, about um, removal of, of invasives and how the, even the means of doing it and whether or not we should at least have a conversation about it and see whether there might be opportunities to get rid of some of the, mm -hmm. the stuff that's invading mm -hmm. some of our last wild places or at least the edges of it. And, yep. and, and so if, if we need to do it at a bylaw, I guess we're going to miss out on that because that's a, that's a fairly complicated thing to do. But if we could yeah. do it with regs, then yeah, we've got 
we've got months. I think, to, yeah, to do. I think they can live in rules and regs. So we definitely have plenty of time. And it is weird that basically our regulations, I don't even think mention the word invasives. So it's, um, I kind of want to look at other bylaws too, not just Duxbury. I know, Eric, you've sent me some stuff too. So I need to read through all that. But, um, you know, I think the Cape and other towns that deal with these invasive projects, they definitely have some great language that we can look at yep. um, from a coastal and from a wetlands perspective. Yep. Charlotte, some of the areas that are really pioneered in this area of invasive control are the islands, Nantucket mm -hmm. and Martha's Vineyard, because mm -hmm. they have vast areas of, of, of brackish water that are mm -hmm. very important for tourism, for yep. oysters and, you know, shellfish and all that. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, yeah, they've done a lot of work there. And I think probably come in the end to a, up against a hard wall because they remove the invasives. But then what next? They don't know how to replant and to reset the area whereby mm -hmm. the invasives are not coming back. So there's, mm -hmm. a, there's still a lot of open science. Mm -hmm. People like Tom should be able to dig into, I hope, all right? <laughs> because it's certainly not a complete circle or, or, or solution. Well, well, well you, and, you and Chris are... are, are much more biological than I am. So, uh, and, and and I mean, I don't, I, I, I barely know the names of the trees around here. <laughs> yeah, I know. But you know, Charlotte, I, we have a, a case, I'm not gonna mention what it is, where um, we have someone going in for a restoration of less than a thousand square feet of a resource area. Well, mm -hmm. while the guy is chopping away 4,000 square feet of BBW of, of, or uh, of um, buffer area. And it falls into that no man's land, is this allowed? And I can't find anything to deal with it. So there's some conundrums here that are very important that we're kind of get blindsided with. Yeah, definitely. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that language in our regulations, I think can definitely be improved to give us more clarity on projects like that in the future. Uh, Cause we haven't seen projects like that that are altering more than a thousand square feet of resource area, except yeah. for a few others, which I won't mention, but um, it's it's uh, definitely a lot that we need to look that's, at. That's resource area. We're not talking about buffer zone. Oh yeah, I meant both basically, I mean, buffer, buffer and zone resource. <laughs> kind of left out of the equation. Yeah. Another one early on, permission to go on a property. You know, people send us things saying, we grant you permission to go on my property. Well, if you go in the early part of our rules and regulations, we're allowed to go wherever we want. As yes long as and it's no. Um, yes. As long well, as it's in, in pursuit of our goals and of the work of the, uh, the, the wetland regulations that we're pursuing. So yeah, yeah. there is there's, there's um, a problem called the Fourth Amendment a, there. Yeah, uh, there's a, you also got a problem with the guy with the shotgun. <laughs> so yeah, there's a uh, there's actually a big awkward. Um, it's straight up in the order of conditions. It's in our bylaws. It's in our regulations. Whatever wherever it is, but all of that does not supersede the Fourth Amendment for illegal search and seizure. So technically, we all need to get written and or verbal commission to go on sites. So I've actually created a permission to access site form at the request of legal counsel. I think this is actually yeah. like one of the first days that I started. She gave us this general template. So I've actually been for every application asking people to sign that document so that is that the fourth or the second <laughs> amendment? It's the right? written permission. You know? So, Get it so, right. so Charlotte, I mean, um, it seems Sorry, like one way around this is to uh, require that the applicant give us permission prior mm -hmm. to even getting yeah. the permit. Absolutely. If they want us to review yeah. um, work in in, on, the, can, uh... in the resource area or the buffer. Um, that in order to do that, they have to sign a release. Mm -hmm. for Let me pull it up so that you guys can see what I'm talking about, because this is something that I made uh, at the, the legal counsel gave me the template. And I haven't post, I don't know if I have posted it to the website yet, but I've basically been asking people since I think like January, February to sign these forms. And of course, um, you know, they, they are helpful in documenting uh, permission to access the site. So it's very, very general. This was legal counsel's template where we're literally just saying, I hereby give permission to the conservation commission, its agents and members or their designees to access the property designated above as needed to perform their duties in relation to the application. So this I've been asking for, um, for NOIs, RDAs and stormwater permits. Um, so yeah, this is, this kind of helps us. Uh, but, but yeah. It should be a requirement before we even hear the case that they, they, they agree beforehand that um, mm -hmm. we, we do have that yeah. access. If they, um, 
if they if they submit this with the NOI or the stormwater yeah. package, then yeah, yeah, yeah we have it. Yeah. 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 But you know, but, Michelle, there's, you know there's, there's another side to it, which is that I think we have to be courteous toward the landowner, such as knocking on the front door. Of course, and, and, yeah. And not, announcing the fact that yeah, we're don't just in. walk around uh, the backyard like other people have right. been told did. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. But you know, the, the town hall has told me that that they 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 don't accept us going on without without really? Okay. Without, I don't know if they're gonna back us up if we get in trouble. Without yeah. what first I'm sorry, I missed that. Without without calling ahead and yeah. asking for permission. Yeah. So. Most um most of my visits, I'm I'm usually either notifying a person, knocking on the door, they've already signed the form, you know, it's like all the above. And so I definitely try to be very respectful to that. Um, and sometimes people really just aren't home, but I usually make myself known with a clipboard, a hat. Uh, they've already signed the permission form. So I'm very much like trying to not look like a creep. <laughs> um, and then, uh, yeah, so it is a, it is a, a, I don't know about commissioner specifically, so I'm happy to look into that, but that's kind of what I was told as well, that commissioners, uh, it seems like it's better that the town officials go to the properties than commissioners, but our regulations language says commissioners, it's agent or designees too. So I don't know. I can look into that though, Chris, because that's interesting. I've been told the same thing. Yeah. Um, Folks, I, I gotta leave for I gotta leave now. Um, okay. <laughs> shall, shall we shall we adjourn or would I should I just leave? <laughs> you guys? Uh, I, think should, I think we should adjourn. Um, okay. I'll work motion, on the motion. word document. <laughs> okay, motion to adjourn. Second. So moved. Okay. So moved. All right.